Let's start again. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I have the pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Anikan Uppong. Anikan is a former colleague of mine at the University of KwaZulu Natal, <clears throat> and he is an expert uh, theoretical and computational condensed uh, metaphysicist. And um, he will uh, share with us some of his recent work. He's also involved in one of our NITEX research programs. Right. So Anikan, we are very curious to hear about the progress of the NITEX investments. <laughs> yeah. So Anikan, please, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Petruccione. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, and Magnus Upong, and uh, I teach physics at the University of KwaZulu Natal, where I also run the theoretical and computational condensed matter and materials physics uh, research group. Uh, we are also running the advanced uh, materials modeling research program uh, under NITEX. But for today's uh, colloquium, I'm going to address uh, you on a topic I aptly titled, Proving the Nature of Many-Body Entanglement in Quantum Spin Liquids, uh, Insights from Lattice Gauge Theory. And uh, it is important that I lead you into part of the thoughts that form the basis for the research directions that we've been pursuing in the last couple of uh, Yes, um, as you probably know, uh, in the past, uh, quantum field theory has really been the mainstay of uh, physicists to uh, feature mainly in the high energy physics community. But over the years, in fact, in the last 20 years, starting from, I think, 2003, when Wen wrote his book on uh, uh, quantum field theories as applied to condensed matter systems, I became intrinsically interested in the non-relativistic quantum field theory of a propagating electron that travels on a lattice. So at this point, then, let me define what I mean by lattice field theory, so that you will understand where I'm going with it. Because as you probably know, in traditional curriculums in physics, uh, people are introduced to solid state physics. They will tell you electrons are propagating in a periodic uh, potential of a crystalline solid subject to Bloch's theorem. Now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, if the elementary fields that make up the world around us are quantized when energies are very high and masses are very small. Small. Sorry. This, the screen is on. Then it is proper to imagine that the same theory can be gauged to integrate out the high energy portion of the spectrum to focus more on the uh, low energy part of the spectrum uh, for a propagating electron on a lattice. So lattice field theory in this context is a quantum field theory that has been uh, developed for a discretized space time. Uh, in this case, the lattice constitutes uh, a crystalline uh, lattice that is formed by real materials. And the objects, the quantum objects of that theory are fermionic particles. And you see that it is possible to reformulate quantum field theory in the non-relativistic limit and apply them to an electron that is propagating in a periodic solid and extract insights from that and used to understand uh, a material that hosts uh, 
broken symmetry ground state. I mean, these are languages that are familiar to uh, people who build uh, uh, field theories to describe gluons and plasma in uh, quantum chromodynamics. Uh, so this work is uh, motivated by the book I've been reading, uh, from uh, written by Eduardo Fratkin, titled Field Theories of Condensed Matter, because it is the main inspiration behind most of the theories and models that I developed to understand the behavior of electrons in a lattice. Um, recently, I started a collaboration with an experimentalist out in uh, Brazil, and uh, they have the capability to access quantum phenomena at temperatures approaching absolute zero. The last time I visited them, uh, I was astonished to see a cryogenic uh, facility that uh, allows them to access quantum mechanical phenomena happening at around two Kelvin. I know that may not be the state of the art around the world, but the state of the art in terms of uh, low temperatures achievable, but uh, to me, it's a good enough limit to begin to access most of the uh, quantum uh, phenomena that we study theoretically and computationally. All right, so, as you probably know, entanglement is a non-local property. Uh, and it is quickly becoming a resource for the development of quantum technologies. Uh, for example, there's a recent paper uh, written by Conlon and his uh, co-workers that show uh, quantum entanglement as a resource for developing uh, quantum computing technologies. I think it is important too to mention that Part of the work I am doing with the South African Quantum Technologies Initiative uh, also enforces uh, my interest in this theme, in, in exploring the, the quantum world, but from the perspective of uh, developing technologies for sensing, for imaging, uh, for communication, and for uh, computing. Those are not all the quantum technologies that are accessible at the moment. Uh, I dare say that uh, there are people in, there are at least one person that I know in this audience who is an expert in quantum computing from the perspective of uh, uh, this SAQTI, and that's Professor Petrucione. Right, but uh, where I come into that is uh, from the perspective of the development of fault-tolerant quantum computing. You will see in the course of this talk that uh, some of the materials that I am going to uh, be sharing with you are supporting non-abelian anions. And those non-abelian anions are topological. And because they are uh, protected against external perturbations, in fact, their state function is not localized by disorder, uh, we believe that uh, materials that host such uh, states could potentially be building blocks for the development of uh, uh, technologies for quantum uh, computing. I mean, the fault-tolerant brand of quantum computing. So then, uh, part of the question that this colloquium will try to answer is, how can we sense quantum entanglement in a many-body solid? And to answer that uh, question, I'm going to draw insights extensively from uh, quantum field theory as applied to non-relativistic electrons forgetting in a lattice. All right, so uh, for you to get a sense of where condensed matter is sitting, I've put here uh, something like a roadmap where on the positive y-axis, I plot the time scale, and on the negative y-axis, I plot the energy scale. And then on the positive x-axis, I plot con different categories of condensed matter system. And these categories of condensed matter systems are limited by the number of constituents. So for example, you could have an isolated uh, atom, you could have a binary atom, tenaries, quaternaries, like alloy systems, up to 
simplest biological uh, system that are made up of uh, molecules. But let's start here. You know that the world of high energy physics deals with super high energies in the uh, giga electron volt. There, they deal with uh, things like quarks, gluons, and the rest. And that's where quantum field theory uh, uh, features predominantly. Um, but suppose that we choose to ignore the chemistry side of materials and think purely from the fact that a macroscopic many-body system is made up of quantum objects, then the rules of quantum mechanics must apply. However, in the analogy that I drew earlier on, you could imagine that the lattice constants of real materials are in the order of angstrom. It's not very large. Therefore, the degrees of freedom on, of the electron is kind of limited. The propagation of the electron on a crystal lattice is going to be confined by the periodic potential that uh, is set up by the crystal structure. So then, the rules of quantum mechanics still apply. It is out of that, uh, that arrangement that condensed matter field uh, physics emerges. Where I sit in, in that space is to use the theories of physics, apply them to models of materials, and compute them. So I kind of wear two hats, a theory on one side, and then implementing the theory uh, computationally. And this is where the Center for High Performance Computing plays a very big role in offering a platform for me to run my computational experiment. So uh, it's important that I, I mention that. Now, that non-relativistic quantum field theory that I talked about for gauging the properties of quantum objects on a lattice leads to a very interesting new class of physics, what I call emergent phenomena. Now, you will notice as this talk uh, evolves that it is no longer sufficient to just know everything there is to know about a single component of a macroscopic many-body system. For example, if I quote uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, a British physicist, he said, we used to think that if we knew one, we knew two because one and one are two. We are finding that we must learn a great deal more about and. In that sense, if you imagine that your microscopic many-body solid is made up of Avogadro number of atoms packed in a crystal lattice, perhaps you could isolate one of those atoms and study it in great details. People have done it in the past. But now, what happens when you put two of those atoms together? You put 10 of them. You put a Avogadro number of it. I tell you, the laws of physics are invariant in time and uh, uh, spatial uh, uh, coordinate translations. So those rules are valid. But we see a totally new kind of physics emerge out of that collective dynamics. So that is what this talk is going to be about. And to appreciate it, we need new experiments. That's why I'm seeking out good experimentalists to have a capability to access the kind of physics that I'm interested in and people who are capable of uh, developing materials that post quantum phenomena. And uh, it then means we need new concepts, new formalism, sometimes not necessarily new theories, but a rethink about how to use old theories. All right, so let's go back to school. Third year solid state physics. Uh, we were introduced to the electron gas model of solids that if you put a single electron on uh, the outermost orbit of an atom, you're going to get a metal. What happens if you increase the electronic degree of freedom, and make it two electrons? The electron is a quantum object. It is endowed with uh, spin. Uh, when those spins pair in that manner, 
you get a singlet. The system becomes an insulator. In fact, it becomes a band insulator. But that is not always the case. There are scenarios where you'll end up having a, a, a smaller band gap than you would in an insulator. Now, but let's think about a scenario where you create a realistic metal like lithium or even aluminum, and you allow only one electron to sit on the outermost uh, uh, orbital, you will see that those electrons are not constrained to remain where you put them. They can move anywhere, and they do so randomly. Now, the theory that uh, used to think about this was given to us in the 1930s by Arnold Sommerfeld. I believe that that is a good starting point to understand condensed matter theory, because it is the first realistic application of uh, the first quantization rule to think about what the electron is actually doing in a crystal uh, material, in a crystalline material. So, but suffice it to say then that that arrangement that I just showed to you gives us what we now understand as the electron gas model of a solid, where uh, you're really only interested in what happens at the Fermi level. So, all the physics is con is described by the structure of your Fermi surface, uh, the kind of dispersion that you get, uh, the energy dispersion as a function of wave vector uh, at the Fermi uh, level. Um, now let's deepen the mystery and look at a totally different uh, class of uh, materials that are called transition metal oxides because that is where quantum spin liquids emerge from. If you do not understand how the quantum mechanics of uh, transition metal oxides uh, should be thought about, you probably never get a good grasp of uh, what is going on with the quantum spin liquid. So uh, transition metal oxides uh, host one electron in the outermost orbital, which happens to be the d orbital. But for you to understand what is going on with the d orbital, just pardon the nature of this uh, image, but just focus on this plot on your right hand side. These are the wave functions of the uh, n equal three orbital state, right? So there is uh, the s state, the l state wave function, and the d, sorry, that's spd. SPD, that's uh, 3S, 3P, 3D uh, state functions. Now, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the bandwidth of those wave functions become narrower as the angular momentum quantum number increases. To such an extent that when you have the L equals two state, the bandwidth is a lot smaller than when you are uh, at the S or the P state. So we tend to Think about this by saying that the wave function becomes localized. The, the D uh, band wave function becomes localized. So when electrons sit on those wave functions, those localized wave functions of the D orbital, they become correlated. And because they are correlated, uh, they they become strongly entangled. And later on, I'll, I'll show you some argument that was given to us in the early 1970s by uh, Philip Warren Anderson. So think about uh, the uh, entanglement of two isolated spins. So you could then extrapolate and realize that for transition metal oxides, their Fermi energy is typically of the order of two electron volts. But because of the magnitude of uh, Columbic repulsion between those uh, uh, valence electrons of the d orbital, which sometimes can have magnitude as high as 10 electron volts. Now you see that there's always a competition between the Columbic repulsion and the degrees of freedom of getting electrons. That further 
uh, strengthens the entanglement from the point of view of making uh, the valence electron to become, uh, should I say, confined. So the general scenario is that strong Columbic repulsion kind of frustrates electron motion. It doesn't allow electrons to move freely on the lattice. And the result is that you end up getting an electron liquid. However, in the limit where the uh, columbic repulsion is very high, you form an electron solid. And electrons can only move when there are vacancies or defects on this uh, uh, material. And that scenario leads to a much insulator. So you, uh, you end up with a, a scenario where the charge degree of freedom of the electron is completely blocked. And the system requires a vacant site, as you saw in that uh, animation, for, for the electron to move. For, for instance, uh, without the vacant site, there's no charge conductivity because the system is uh, an insulator. However, the interesting thing is that because spins up and spin down are quantum objects, and the system still repay, it retains that quantum object, the solid, though an insulator, is magnetic. So you see that that uh, foundation leads us to a scenario where a correlated electron solid forms in mott insulators. And that system is characterized by a multiplicity of uh, quantum degrees of freedom. Because if you realistically want to describe that material, then you cannot discount the charge degree of freedom. That's a quantum object. You can't discount the spins. You can't uh, discount the fivefold degenerate uh, angular momentum quantum numbers that that system throws up. So that is the physics we'll have to deal with, for example, in a material like nickel oxide. And uh, unfortunately for us, that model that we teach to our students at the undergraduate level fails completely in describing a material with uh, uh, confined electrons like this. So that theory, though it works for simple metals like lithium, aluminum, and maybe in fact, it won't work for copper because copper is in, supports the nearly free electron model. We have to think differently in order to capture the physics of a material uh, like uh, nickel oxide. All right. So now let's go back and think about how we can extract entanglement from quantum objects. And the traditional way to think about this is to ask where will information be located when you have two isolated spins, one spinning up and one spinning down, where the net spin moment is zero? Um, the way to think about this is to realize that the einstein podolsky rosen uh, uh, paradox allows us to describe the macroscopic state of the combined system as uh, an entanglement between the two qubits of information denoted by spin one and two. All right, so in a microscopic many body system that supports many uh, valence electrons, you are not dealing with only two spins, you are dealing with a Avogadro number of spins. So it is safe to think about our system as a macroscopically entangled uh, quantum system. So, and uh, as you'll see, the many body quantum entanglement that arises out of that macroscopic many body entanglement is purely topological. And uh, they are such that in some classes of materials, as I'm going to share with you, uh, top topological operations of the braid group are supported. However, in that whole arrangement, the, uh, 
it is not permitted that uh, any technology that uh, is developed for things like uh, quantum communication uh, can ever achieve a faster than light uh, uh, communication. It's not possible. It will violate the rules of uh, quantum mechanics. All right, so in that sense, we'd like to think about macroscopic entanglement as if it is unstable to uh, uh, decoherence, because if we draw an analogy between a macroscopic many-body system that is interacting with the environment, then that state that corresponds to the EPR singlet, but for a macroscopic many-body system, is not going to be uh, isolated from the environment. So and if you think about it from the perspective of entanglement being uh, where the Schrodinger cat is in one sense alive and in the other sense dead, then you could imagine that our macroscopic many-body system is hiding under uh, the coherence. It's like the thinking in terms of the Schrodinger during the cat experiment, is like your cat is hiding behind the curtains, I think in that sense. So uh, our macroscopic many-body uh, system is entangled. Yes, we have established that fact. But that entanglement is not stable to coherence. If you expose it to the environment, you will destroy that uh, entanglement. That's, that's the message I want to bring up. All right. So, what is a quantum spin liquid? It is proper that I give you an intuitive framework with which to use to think about it before I define it formally. And uh, fortunately, as I mentioned earlier on, Philip Anderson gave us uh, 50 years ago uh, a definition of uh, a quantum spin liquid as a quantum liquid of spin. So, you can imagine then that a macroscopic many-body system will be uh, uh, defined from the perspective of the resonating valence bond state of a macroscopic many-body system, where the state function is a massive superposition of EPR pairs. So you can imagine then that uh, there are two features. There's, there are spin zero pairs, which I call the EPR pairs, colored blue there, and they are sitting on a lattice subject to some selection rules that has to be obeyed at all times. And the macroscopic many-body system then becomes a massive superposition state. Um, it is important that uh, I give this credit to uh, Philip Anderson because he has inspired the way I think about physics in condensed matter theory. Uh, and uh, may his soul rest in peace. He he died during the COVID pandemic in, in March of 2020. But you can imagine that a theory that he put forward in the 1970s is still very relevant today, as you're going to see in a moment. So let's see the phases that emerge in a transition metal oxide. You could see that there's a very rich vein of phases. So you could imagine the electron is endowed with uh, a charge degree of freedom, spin degree of freedom, and orbital degree of freedom in that cartoon. Then you could have a solid in a crystal, a liquid when the lattice structure is broken. Uh, but there's some uh, short range order preserved. And then you have a gas phase where um, there's no order of any kind, but there's, uh, the state is symmetrical because there's no broken symmetry there. If you rotate a gas, you still get a disordered state. Now, a transition metal oxide supports a super, a super fluid phase where you could have a partitioning of certain degrees of freedom. Now, in thinking in this way, you need to explicitly uh, bear in mind that the atom on its own is a quantum object, even though the electron that uh, are attached to them are also carrying independent quantum objects on, in their own right. So there's also a liquid crystal, a spin liquid, where though the atoms are sitting on well-defined lattice points, the spin orientations are ordered completely randomly. So 
There is no sense of local order at play. And then you could have orbital liquid. This has not been observed in reality at the moment. Nobody has uh, published it yet, but there are, there are theoretical conjectures that some materials could be made to behave like orbital liquid. Um, now, the big difference here is that though the atoms in yellow are sitting at their equilibrium positions in their lattice sites, the orbital degrees of freedom of their valence electrons are aligned randomly. All right, so I've put a, a bit of uh, note in here, but the key thing is that a quantum spin liquid is a phase of quantum matter that is formed purely by interacting uh, spins in frustrated magnetic materials. In a bit, I'm going to show you what I mean by frustrated uh, uh, magnetic materials. Uh, this class of uh, materials are characterized by uh, long-range quantum entanglement, and they support fractionalized excitations. And what I mean by that is that if you imagine that uh, the EK dispersion that gives you information about the the propagation of uh, valence electrons in the band picture only tells you about what the electron uh, is doing from the transport picture. It tell you, is this material a metal? Is it an insulator? Or is it a semiconductor? That picture uh, kind of gives way when you bring in arguments from the lattice field theory in the sense that you could now interpret the low energy dispersion of electrons in the band to explicitly account for collective excitation modes of the lattice arising as a result of the decomposition of an electron into more fundamental particles that I will define as either a vison or a spinon, or uh, I think there's another one which I will uh, mention, a, a holon. A holon, there's an orbiton, and a spinon. So, what am I telling you? I am telling you that just like lattice gauge theory allowed high energy physicists to build a symmetric quantum field theories that allowed them to interpret a hadronic matter from the perspective of a, a quark blown and pla uh, quark blown plasma, now condensed matter theories are. Now, building non-relativistic quantum field theories that allow them to look at an electron as a composite quantum object made up of something that is a lot more fundamental than an electron called a spinon, in a case where spin is a true eigenstate of the Hamiltonian of the system, or orbiton, in a case where orbital degrees of freedom define the emergent property of the macroscopic system, or a holon where the are vortex states supported in that system. So spinons, before I leave, are one of, sorry, spinons, yes. So spinons uh, are one of the three quasi-particles along with holons and orbitons that electrons in solids can split into during the process of spin to charge separation when they are confined tightly at temperatures close to absolute zero. All right, so now that we've defined what it is, let's see if we can uh, lay our hands on some examples. So there are four types of quantum spin liquids. The one out focus my talk on are called topological quantum spin liquids. And I've told you the reason why, because I'm interested in uh, topological objects uh, because of the ability to support uh, topological braid statistics that allows one to think about topological uh, uh, quantum computers. That is fault tolerant quantum computing. That, that is the main motivation. Now, Topological quantum spin liquids support this EPR pairs in the lattice, and they support anionic spinons. But there's also another type of uh, quantum spin liquid called uh, the unitary 
the U1 QSL that is the, 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 the support, the propagation of electric and magnetic field pairs. That is monopoles of electric and magnetic fields propagating as a pair. I know that sounds uh, weird to hear because you probably have heard in uh, classical electrodynamics that uh, the magnetic monopole does not exist in isolation. Well, uh, <laughs> things are changing. Uh, people have built field theories that support that. And this model supports the propagation of a gauge boson as a U1 gauge. All right, there's also the Dirac quantum spin liquid, which uh, supports this Dirac type cones. You wouldn't find it in uh, a graphene like lattice, but you will see it in strongly interacting Dirac fermionic system, like the Kitev lattice, which I'm going to, uh, uh, electrons propagating on a, a Kitev lattice, which I will show you later. And, but the beautiful thing about the kind of things we do computationally is that you can perform computational experiment on graphene to tune the electron hopping along the three main bonds centered on a given carbon atom on a chicken wire lattice of graphene and see that if you vary those uh, hopping interactions, you can actually create a strongly interacting Dirac fermionic species on that lattice. This talk will not uh, focus on that, but suffice it to say that uh, in May this year, I graduated a PhD whose work was mirroring that physics. And then lastly, there's a spin-on Fermi surface uh, quantum liquid, which is supported by the SACDEV Yekitev model, which I'll mention towards the end of this talk. And it's uh, explicitly giving rise to a non-Fermi liquid type of spin meta. All right, so, sorry, before I leave, I've also given you candidate materials or lattices that support each of those types of uh, uh, quantum liquid systems that I uh, gave to you. However, I might add that these examples do not correlate. So don't think that the Kagome lattice will support the topological uh, quantum spin liquid. No, I'm just listing them in no order at all. However, uh, in my own work, especially the work I'm going to share with you today, I will mention some kind of uh, computational experiment that I've performed to try and mimic the behavior of electrons on uh, the Kagome lattice and the Kitev type of material. Uh, but uh, I won't talk about quantum spin ice because I've not really uh, had the motivation to think about it. Uh, but uh, organic uh, quantum spin liquids are very important to my experimental collaborator because as you can imagine, he got his PhD out of that, so he was very sentimentally attached to it. <laughs> so, so they believe that they can uh, understand this material that support this kind of phase to such an extent that they can tune those EPR pairs in, the, in that class of material by engineering the criticality, the quantum criticality of the spin degrees of freedom in that kind of material. I'll come back to that. All right, so here is uh, the sample material my experimental collaborator is interested in. You could imagine that this material uh, is the kappa phase of this uh, molecular salt. Uh, good luck trying to pronounce the full name, but I'll hazard a try. Uh, it's a uh, bis ethylene dithiotetrathiopulvaline. I'm not a chemist, so pardon me if I messed that up, but I, no, I didn't. Now, let's go back to the physics. This is the unit cell of this material. Let me tell you a couple of things about this material. The unit cell is very large. It has 120 atoms. So even with the GPU computing capability at the CHPC, the calculation does not converge, so it's a waste of computing time trying to think about it from the perspective of uh, consum DFT. It just does not work. I've tried it, it doesn't work. Anybody that tells you it works is lying to you. Now, this material has a, a non-magnetic cation layer that I label as X on top and on the bottom there, and then 
sandwiches a conducting layer that I call ET in that formula. Now, that conducting layer uh, is made up of uh, an organic framework of sulfur. So you can imagine then that if we look at the top view of the conducting ET layer, we can group some atoms into these red balls, right? Now, the way you can extract some reasonable information out of this is to think from the perspective of the fact that there's some symmetry coming out of those red balls. I don't know if you can see it, but I can tell you that I can form a triangular lattice out of those red balls. You could see that uh, I can pick one of those red balls and place it at the position of the gray uh, sphere on the triangular lattice here, right? Can you see that? So what? when I tell you that this quantum spin liquid candidate uh, is modeled on uh, uh, a triangular lattice. What I mean really is that this group of atoms are lifted and placed at the position of that gray ball on a triangular lattice. So there are two competing energy scales that we must always be alert to. The first energy scale is what goes on within this uh, sphere. The second energy scale is what happens when electrons are hopping from this group of atoms from one side to the other. So that is what we are trying to understand. How can we understand what is happening within this sphere and also understand what is happening on this lattice? That is where uh, uh, lattice gauge theory, non-relativistic lattice gauge theory uh, uh, plays a role. So these ET dimers are simplified to, to the triangular lattice model with each side occupied by exactly one electron. Uh, we are going to engineer the hopping in such a way that uh, we can get uh, a totally different kind of physics. Now, I mentioned that uh, quantum spin liquids are formed by systems uh, that uh, are intrinsically frustrated. I will try to explain quickly uh, what I mean by frustration. Um, so if you imagine uh, a lattice that has been discretized in such a way that there's square symmetry, and you place a single spin at each lattice point. You can get the nil ordered uh, ground state simply because two EPR pairs, when placed on the four lattice sides of the square, you'll get a net uh, spin moment of zero. Now, you could, for what it's worth, create an antiferromagnetic ground state out of this. You could create a ferromagnetic ground state if you want, but that is not interesting physics. Here is where things start getting interesting. Supposing I have some mechanism that I can break the symmetry of this square lattice and transform it into a triangular lattice by distorting it, either by stretching it or compressing it or doing any other thing through some physical mechanism that my lattice is now of triangular symmetry. Now, I deliberately ask myself, how should I orient my spin such that I get the uh, EPR singlet? So suppose I align the first one up and the second one down, I get an EPR pair with net spin of zero. But my question to you is, how should I orient the third spin such that the net spin of my macroscopic many-body system should vanish. Because of the intrinsic difficulty in finding the correct orientation for the spin that can take you into a nil ordered antiferromagnetic ground state, this lattice becomes spin frustrated. And it is that frustration that constitutes the predominant mechanism that gives rise to the quantum spin liquid ground state at absolute zero. Now, that frustration gives rise to uh, important uh, physical phenomena. The first one is that you cannot have long range magnetic order in that system. The second thing is that that intrinsic absence of magnetic long range order allows the uh, system to be imbued with 
emergent quantum phenomena. And that is the goal of what my research uh, program is trying to understand. How do we understand those emergent quantum phenomena and how do we beneficiate it in such a way that we can create quantum technologies out of it? Quantum technologies that we can use to sense, or do any other thing that we wish. All right, so uh, traditionally, everybody knows that uh, uh, the Hamiltonian model allows you direct access to the total energy where you can uh, construct the interaction between one spin and the near neighbor side, and you allow that interaction to be isotropic throughout the entire lattice. And then you construct a Hamiltonian. And you can also uh, uh, create a nil ordered ground state such that uh, the uh, Q vector supports 180, 180 spin uh, orientation with a net spin of zero with a vanishing uh, uh, Z component of spin. In other words, all the spins are coupled in such a way that the net magnetic moment vanishes. The, the thing is, even when that happens, as you saw in the EPR uh, uh, pair, the ground state will still support uh, a quantum entanglement of the spins. Now, this is uh, to show you then the consequence of uh, that broken symmetry in the lattice, uh, in the sense that the Ising spin symmetry on the square lattice leaves us with only two ground states. It's either you orient your spins in that manner or in that manner. No other degree of freedom. But when you break the symmetry of the lattice such that uh, your structure is now explicitly triangular, uh, you see that the nil ordered antiferromagnetic ground state has uh, is now sixfold degenerate. Now, here is a simple example of where a case where a broken symmetry of uh, a square lattice transforms it into something that has a triangular symmetry. You could see that the net spin in this structure is not going to be aligned along a well-defined direction of spin quantization. You cannot say that the total spin in this structure is aligned towards that. No, it doesn't work. Uh, same here. Now, there are physical agencies that we can use to transform this lattice into that. As I mentioned earlier, you can choose to stretch it, you can choose to compress it. All right, so in doing this kind of uh, uh, graph mapping, graphing the lattice points and transforming it from here to there, of course, there are a couple of rules that must be followed. I've listed them there. The number of incoming arrows on each triangle must be even just so that the EPR pair uh, must form. And the rules were given by Philip Anderson 50 years ago, so it's not a new physics, but what we get out of it is sublime. All right, so before I leave, suffice it to say then that all three spins on a triangular lattice cannot be anti-parallel due to frustration, and the six-fold 120 degree nil ground state form instead of the two ground states that are mandated by the Ising spin symmetry for spin up and spin down. And uh, how do we build a formal theoretical framework to uh, understand the quantum spin liquid uh, based on everything that I've told you? So the usual starting point for those who are uh, into quantum field theory is usually to start with the Lagrangian density, but I'm going to talk to you about this from the perspective of building that Lagrangian density, strictly speaking, for a block electron. But this is applicable to any other uh, dynamical system. So, uh, in fact, uh, in, the, in, in the research work that I do, I, I look at the electron as a dynamical system. So, to that extent, we can build a Lagrangian field theory where uh, psi is an electron field operator. I know that in Hamiltonian mechanics, rather in, uh, in quantum physics, at, uh, uh, in standard physics curriculum, you say that psi is the state function, wave function of the electron. Uh, rather, 
you think about it as the electron field operator, which we can choose to quantize if you want. All right, so a, a psi dagger is the adjoint, so the self adjoint of the electron field operator, m is the mass of the electron, uh, v is the uh, potential of the lattices, and uh, x and t are our space time coordinates defined on a lattice. Please pay attention to the fact that I've not bothered about the chemistry of the material that uh, I'm interested in. I've, I've completely ignored chemistry, simply because uh, the way I discretize my space time will incorporate all the chemistry. So I don't need to worry about it. Then we can write the action by integrating that Lagrangian density over our space time, which I warn you constitutes a well defined lattice with a lattice parameter. Okay? So if we do that, then we get access to the partition function. Uh, we can obtain it as a, uh, an integration over all field configuration. And from there, we can gain access to uh, the total. Uh, the density matrix of, of a total system. So uh, now I deliberately put this here so that you realize that once I get my partition function, then I can calculate any other thing I need to calculate about the system without bothering about the details of the chemistry. I can get the uh, Boltzmann free energy of the system, or what is also known as the Hemos free energy. I can calculate the entropy. And once I get the uh, Density matrix, uh, I can find a way of tracing out uh, a component of that system if I by partition it and get access to the entanglement entropy. And by that, I gain direct access to uh, quantum information uh, of our system. So that whole arrangement is. Uh, is supported by a compact framework that has been discussed in quantum field theory and condensed matter physics uh, by Alexander Atland and Ben Simon. All right, so in terms of building field theories for condensed matter, uh, I deliberately want my quantum field theory to be non-relativistic simply because the electron is not traveling at speeds that are anywhere close to the speed of light. Uh, so the action for the lattice fermions is expressed in terms of Grassmann fields, where x is my lattice site. Again, the bar there denotes uh, uh, the adjoint. So the action is written to account for the anti-commuting nature of the fermionic degrees of freedom. But the important point here is that I now introduce a, de a lattice Dirac operator, which describes the hopping of fermions uh, between lattice sites. I am going to use that a lot as a degree of freedom in engineering my systems to access that uh, uh, quantum spin liquid ground state. So the lattice Dirac operator is often represented formally as a sum over neighboring lattice sites. And in a simple case of near neighbor hopping, it is written as a uh, a linear combination of terms. You could see T is the strength of the hopping, which I will normalize. I typically would normalize that T to the ground state energy that I extract from an exact theory like density functional theory. Then A of mu is my lattice gauge. That is the gauge field in of the background lattice, which I can choose to uh, integrate out. If, uh, it supports the correct physics, A is the lattice spacing, T is the hopping parameter, and M, M is the electronic mass. Uh, it's usually uh, ideal nowadays to work in a scale where the normalized Planck constant is set to one, Boltzmann constant set to one, so that I can also set the mass of the electron to one. Five more minutes. Wow. Okay. All right, so, um, all rules of conformal field theory apply, so we can gain access to uh, critical phenomena, scale invariance, symmetries, and uh, in order to understand how conformal field theory of lattice fermions uh, in non-relativistic QFT uh, 
and their connections to realistic materials. Uh, in the context of this work, it is important to realize that we are looking at the quantum critical point phase transitions universality uh, classes in lattices that are small, and we want to look at the emergent uh, scaling of the conformal symmetry of our lattice. So to achieve that, what I do to break the uh, scale invariance is to do these four cardinal points that I list at the corner. Uh, identify re relevant degrees of freedom, integrate out high energy modes, incorporate relevant interactions, and try to match the experimental observations. Unfortunately, uh, what I'm going to share with you today does not have an experimental backing yet, simply because I've only just started the collaboration. But suffice it to say then that uh, the first set of results that we've tested, uh, the model that I just shared with you, is benchmarked against outcomes of the kitev tori code model, which is a lattice gauge model, and the kitev honeycomb lattice model, which is a quantum spin model. Now, the Hamiltonian of the uh, uh, toric code supports a, a ground state degeneracy and anionic excitations. This is pretty standard. It's been known now for 20 years, so I'm not going to waste my time talking to you about it. But please note that moving an electron around an, a, a Majorana particle on that lattice uh, uh, causes an overall state of the system to pick up a phase of minus one uh, because of the X and Z string anti-commutativity on the square lattice. I don't want to go into the details, but I just put it there to one, tell you that this model is known to support uh, anionic excitations. Two, that anionic excitations are expected in systems that support the quantum spin liquid ground state. And three, to show you that if in the case of the Kitev honeycomb lattice, if we uh, introduce an isotropic hopping along the three bonds of our, our hexagonal lattice, these are the bonds I'm talking about, the X, Y, and Z bonds. So if we allow electrons to hop in a, a should I say, non homogeneous manner, that is, the strength of the hopping along there and along there and along there are different, then we get this phase diagram. You can get a gapless phase and you can get a gap phase depending on the parameter chosen. But the gapless phase denoted by region one is known to acquire a finite gap in a magnetic field, while the gaps phase is the one that has the same universality class as the toric code. And it is known to host anion. So what I've done uh, is to try and uh, use that Dirac hopping operator along the X and the Y direction to recreate the exact pattern construction of the Kitev honeycomb model, because this model is known to support the formation of physical fermions on the system. Again, no EPR pairs form in this system, so I'm beginning to rush. <laughs> Okay, so exchange interactions depend on uh, uh, dependence on the uh, gap parameter. You will see that depending on how I tune the interaction, get a gapless structure, and then uh, you get a, a metal to semiconductor phase transition. And the gapless phase density of states looks like this. And the main features of the uh, <coughs> anionic system is that it the energy gap allows the existence of a, a non-local excitation. So I'm going to uh, conclude then by telling you that on the honey, on the Kagome lattice, the Heisenberg model for such a system brings out a polar structure in the chain number where you can have it. Uh, it, it kind of gives us a macroscopic EPR-like pair where at that point you have a positive uh, uh, sort of a positive polarity at that 
region of the phase space, you get a negative polarity, which takes us back to the same physics that uh, uh, Anderson gave us 50 years ago, that a macroscopic many-body system is completely understandable from the perspective of thinking in terms of uh, spin singlets. Let me stop there and allow you to uh, perhaps interact. But before I conclude, sorry, Francesco, uh, the work we are thinking about doing has already appeared. But uh, to conclude, many body quantum chaos in the Sakdev Yekitev model, which supports Majorana fermions, depends on the number of Majoranas that you put on your system. You could see that uh, as the number of fermion increases, these are the top panel shows odd fermions, while the down panel shows even fermions. You could see that there is no discernible order. By the way, when you put up to 10 fermions, it, it just crashes the computer. It won't, the memory, the data generated is just so large that we can't go. So then to conclude, this is work in progress. We are nowhere near the end yet. But I'd like to thank you, first of all, for uh, coming to listen to me, talk to you. Um, for those of you who are still, if the, I assume there are students in the audience, physics students in the audience, if you're interested in this kind of physics and you want to do more thinking about it, feel free, send me an email, talk to me before I leave the Stellenbosch University. But I thank these uh, organizations for supporting the kind of things I do. Um, in particular, I thank NITEX, because without NITEX, I probably wouldn't be standing here talking to you. Uh, thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you very much, Anikan. Are there questions for Anikan? From the people in the audience? Sure. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, so the first one is, what properties of the matter are determined by those different variations in the in the spin directions in the electron liquid? Okay. Um, the simple answer is magnetic properties. But before you go to magnetic properties, you first look at the you would say ground state properties. Does it have a single ground state or are there multiple ground states? Those are the kind of uh, properties that we want to, or that can be answered. The second property that is controlled are topological properties. Does it support fractionalization of the electron? or not. If it does, what type? Is it a spinon or the holon or even the orbiton? Remember, the uh, orbital spin liquid hasn't been observed yet. So even if we have data to show that it supports the orbiton, then it's not been tested, it's not been verified. So those kind of questions uh, can be answered. And then can it support topological braiding? That is where we are going. We want to be able to say, okay, this material, if we tune it in this way, you, it can support topological braid groups. That's very interesting. If I can ask a second short question. Um, the, the patterns of those spins, uh, are they homo homogenous across the entire uh, matter or do you get patches of different patterns and then maybe those group into bigger patterns that, re that repeat? Excellent question. Um, at the moment, we are not sure what it is. That's why we are doing computational experiments. Remember, I started by, I mentioned during the talk that DFT doesn't work. So we can't think in terms of uh, applying the consum DFT to get a global ground state. No, it does not work. So before we can answer that question definitively, we have to 
do a lot of groping in the dark first. So the, the simple answer is we don't know yet. Thank you. A question? Let's check quickly if there are any questions from the people online. Uh, no, no, it doesn't seem to be the case. Then Anika, thank you very much for your time, for coming to give your talk here in, in person. And um, uh, 